Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the conversation series. I'm thrilled today to have Lauren Bean here with me. She is actually right here in North Carolina with me, and I am I'm thrilled to have another local, but she's also a keynote speaker and a coach. She's helping people reach their goals, um, and she's actually did her big dream and uh, stood on stage and talked at uh, TEDx, um, which I, I loved to hear that speech. Uh, but I'm so excited to have her here with me and I'm going to turn it over to her and let her introduce herself. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me, Danielle. So I'm Lauren Bean. I work in marketing full time, but my true passion is in public speaking and helping others. So a lot of what I speak on and what I'm really passionate about is helping others feel confident enough to go after their goals. So a lot of times we wait until we feel hundred percent ready, or we wait until we check every single box and all of my coaching services and the topics that I speak on are around how can we go after our goals before we have all of those answers and yeah. live those big, bold, crazy dreams. When I was doing my research on you, I want to hop into your two different keynote topics. Um, you have ready enough and then swiping right on your brand. Would love to just to first off jump into why these two topics in particular. Yeah. So, um, swiping right on my brand was my first keynote that I came out with. So as I mentioned, I have a marketing background yeah. and a lot of what, um, people struggled with that I noticed was not necessarily marketing their companies, but marketing themselves as a brand. And how do we think about how the way that we put ourselves out there, especially when it comes to social media, you know, everywhere we are, every channel, we have a digital footprint and, it takes less than half a second for people to form a first impression of you. So that keynote is all about how can we make sure that we're putting the right brand out there to help us meet our goals. So that keynote is all about defining what our values are, uh, what are our big goals, and then how can we make sure that our LinkedIn profiles or Instagram profiles, TikTok, the list goes on. How can we make sure that those align with what we think is inside of us and that we're putting out into the wild? My second, or yeah, my second keynote is um, ready enough. And like I mentioned, that is all about how can we go after our goals before we feel completely ready? Yes. One big realization that I had is ready is a complete lie. And so how can we go after our goals? Even when we feel like we don't have all the answers, how can we kind of push past the scared yeah. and do these big, crazy goals that we have in our heads? What I loved when, when I was listening to your speech is the talk of readiness muscle and how important it is. But I also loved how you had paired it with perfection. And I think that perfection a lot of times gets in the way of us launching things, moving forward in the next steps in our career, or whatever it may be. How do people like, what are the best ways you would suggest for people to get out of their way of perfection? Because you paired it with failure as well. And I think those two are we butt heads with those two yep. all the time. Yeah. Yeah. One thing I realized is that perfectionism is the enemy of done. We can either choose perfection or we can choose to have our goals or our tasks checked off. I like to say that I am a recovering perfectionist because I like things tied up with this neat, pretty bow. I like to feel like things are complete before I put it out there. But um, yeah, to your point, it's, when we try to go towards perfectionism, yeah. it's never going to be completely right. right. So we're right. going to be in this constant state of preparation instead of just doing the thing and going after our goals. So, um, and one thing too is perfectionism kills a lot of our confidence because it's Absolutely. always, you know, thinking, okay, it can be a little bit better. We need to keep tweaking, yeah. keep revising until we get it right. And so um, we need to learn that like perfectionism yeah. that that's not our goal. Our goal is to take these tiny steps to get us closer to our goals. It can be completely messy. And if you're trying something new, it is going to be messy. Yeah. I, um, I have a one-year-old son that just started walking a couple weeks ago, oh, which gosh. is exciting and scary all at the same <laughs> yeah. time, but, um, watching him learn to walk, yeah. he wasn't sitting, preparing, waiting until he can do a full on stride. He takes a little step. He stumbles. He get back, gets back up, takes a few more stumbles, get back up. And that's how we need to approach our goals. It's knowing that we're going to mess up. We're going to get bumps and bruises along the way, 
But each time we do that, we get lessons from it and we can learn from those lessons, apply it to that next iteration and keep going towards our goals instead of waiting, thinking, prepping in our heads before we even take that first step. And what I loved was um, your story of when you were six and you were back, it was the day before your dance recital. Um, and it just made me smile because I think we all have a story of that from our childhood at some point where we were just that stubbornness in us as kids. And we were like, nope, we're still going to, we still want to go do what we want to do. Be damned <laughs> whether we have broken something or what it may be. But I loved that story though, because going back to the readiness muscle, can you describe what that muscle is and why it is so important? Because I think you had the topic around asking for a raise to in that first year. Mm -hmm. Why is it important for women? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, just to give a background to your listeners. So when I was six, I loved doing dance recitals, had yeah. been dancing since I could walk pretty much. Yeah. And it was on a particular day where I was deciding to go after a game of Candyland, but it wasn't on the ground. It was high up on a shelf and I couldn't reach it. Yeah. I've always been headstrong, always just going after my goals, no matter what. And so I decided I'm not going to ask for help. I'm going to climb and get this Candy Land game so that I could play it. So I started climbing and the mission was not accomplished to put it lightly. So I come falling down and our big family boom box, which weighed, weighed about 20 pounds, yeah. comes falling down with it. It didn't get a scratch. That thing was indestructible, but landed right on my foot. And so here I am in the doctor's office having to get a boot placed on my foot the day before my dance recital. And so the doctor is telling me about recovery time and that, yeah, there's no way you're going to be able to dance in the recital tomorrow. And so I get back into the car and I'm in pain and upset that I can't dance in the recital. This is what I work all year for. And my mom turned around and faced me in the back seat and gave me a choice. I could either sit out tomorrow or I could dance through the pain. And so it was in that moment that I knew it was more important to go after my goals, chase my dreams, even if it meant a little bit of pain. So the next day I was still dancing with tights in my boot on stage, did not look the best. It was not my best performance, yes. but what mattered to me is that I was on that stage yes. living the dream. Yes. And so when I talk about flexing our readiness muscle, it's a muscle like any other muscle in our body. The first time you exercise it, it's going to feel clunky. It's like when you go to the gym for the first time and you lift a weight, yes. it's not going to be perfect right off, right, right out of the gate, but it's one thing that we need to keep practicing. So the idea behind the readiness muscle is how can we push ourselves to goals where we don't feel completely ready? Yeah. So when I was at that dance recital, I didn't feel ready. I had a boot yeah. on my foot but I still pushed myself. And so the next time I'm faced with a challenge, I have that evidence to go back on of like, Hey, remember that time when you did this scary thing and it was challenging, look where it got you. So it yeah. gives you the confidence to do another big, scary goal and our goals get bigger and scarier. And so it's important of, even if it's like a small, tiny thing where maybe you want to learn how to bake bread, you've never baked bread a day in your life. Decide that you're ready enough to bake bread and start doing it. It doesn't have to be this big, crazy goal right out the gate, but it's more of just the practice of trying things that scare you a little bit, things that challenge you and knowing that you are ready in that moment and that you're going to learn along the way. I want to just approach the, the goal setting things. How do you approach and how do you come up with your goals? What does that process look like for you? Yeah. So I, I've always been a big dreamer. So okay. usually my goals are really big and really scary. And okay. so yeah. the first time when it pops in my head, I'm like, there's no way I'm doing that. I <laughs> don't even know the first step, like Lauren, yeah. you're crazy. This is not happening. Yeah. But I've noticed that those goals that like feel right deep in your soul, where, you know, it aligns with your gifts, it aligns with your values those are the goals worth chasing. And usually those are the ones that keep coming back. So yeah. yeah, for example, TEDx was a huge dream of mine. It's something that I've been dreaming of since 
2016, long yeah. time in the making. First time I thought of that, I was like, no way. I am not <laughs> doing that. That is a big, crazy goal. Like one yeah. of those things where I was like, I'm not even going to tell anybody. They're going to look at me like I'm crazy. I'm not going to do this. But it was one of those dreams that kept coming back. And yeah. so when I have these big, crazy goals, yeah. think of it like climbing a mountain. We look up and we see that summit. We yeah. There's no way we can reach the top. But I found that any big, crazy goal can be broken down into simple, yeah. easy steps. Yep. So whenever I have a goal, whether it's like a dream job or TEDx, break it down into tiny enough segments where when you look at that individual part, you're like, okay, that's doable. I can do that. So for example, TEDx, first thing I did was Google how to apply to a TEDx or how to be a TEDx speaker. In the big grand scheme of things, that doesn't really feel significant, but it's a necessary first step. And then it's like, okay, I can check that off the list. What's next? And so it's one tiny step after another. And then before you know it, you look up and you've reached that big goal. So it's a matter of taking a lot of tiny steps and kind of almost like project planning in a way of your goals so that each step is manageable along the way. Two things coming off of that. I always find goals to the ones that you have a true amount of passion around. They're the goals that like you can't lay down in bed at night and not be thinking about them. Or like you're like constantly scrolling or like looking up things that you're like kind of reaffirming that, okay, yes, this is, it's like the building the confidence to go and do it. But I always feel like that those goals are the ones that are going to mean the most and have the best journeys with them because you just can't stop thinking about them. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, I and, think that's a powerful thing too. And here's the thing about those types of goals too. You have to want them. Like you have to want to achieve them. No yeah. one else can tell you what your goals are because if it is a big, crazy goal, you have to want it bad enough to where when you face those bumps in the road, yeah, you still want to get to the end result. Yep. You can't yep. be going after a goal because your parents think you'd be good at this or because someone else yeah. told you that you should chase after this. Like you have to know deep within your heart that this is something that you want to chase because that's the only way that you're going to be able to push through yeah. those obstacles and difficulties because No, if a goal is worth chasing, you're going to face bumps. Like there's no straight, easy path. If there was, I would be a millionaire right now. Um, but there's not, it's, there's going to be challenges along the way. So it's important to know that like, these are my values and this is why I want it. Not just because, oh, I think it sounds cool. Yeah, I'll do that. But you have to have a very, very clear. Why do you want this goal? And going back to your summit reference and taking those steps, can you share how many times you apply? I mean, you started back in 2016 applying for TEDx. Can you share how many times like those steps you took to, uh, to speak at TEDx? Yeah. So 2016, that was where I got the dream. It was like, okay, this dream's not going anyway. I need to do something about it. Um, so I started researching, started talking to people in my network that have done talks in the past, just getting a feel for what does it mean to be a TEDx speaker? What is a good TED talk and what in the world am I going to speak on? Um, 2019 was the first time that I actually kind of knew what I wanted to speak on. So I applied to one event, uh, 2019. Yeah. I applied to another six in 2020 applied to another eight events in 2021 In 2022, I applied to another three events. So total mixed in there about 19 events that I had applied to. And that came with 19 rejection emails. So one after another, thank you for your application. Sorry, you're not considered at this time. And so it's frustrating each email. You don't know how many it's going to take before you actually hit that. So each time I would get that rejection email. It hurts. It sucks. It's, you know, you kind of wonder, is this worth chasing? And each time I would go back to like, no, this is something I still really, really want. And so I would keep chasing after it. And I was actually eight months pregnant with my son when I got the email that my big crazy dream was finally happening. So 20th time was a charm for me. Um, But it was just a surreal moment. And uh, the timing of it was just 
absolutely wonderful. I, the specific event that I was selected for happened to be the hometown in Illinois where my grandparents live that I only get to visit once a year. So the timing was incredible, but had I known that it would take 20 times to get it right, I don't know that I would have like kept going after that goal from the beginning. Like that's a big, scary number of rejections. Um, but it was important along the way to understand my goal and that, like, I I wanted to prove to myself that I could do it. And that self-satisfaction, like, even if no one saw my talk, like that was still worth it to me of just knowing that I accomplished that and being able to stand on that dot. And to your point of, if you had known it would have taken 20 tries, that's probably why it's a great thing that none of us can see the end result of our goals, because there may, we may have just been like, nope, we're done. We're not going to, we're not going after this goal. And then it, who knows if it could have spiraled to something else that could have given you a completely different end goal. Um, I think that's, that's, you know, we always wish we can see the question of, do you want to see the past or the future? And it's kind of like, I don't want to see what's going to happen. And I think it's, I think to your point, I think it's great. The journey along the way, because it teaches you things every step of the way teaches you something. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And like I said, just the timing of it worked out. Like, thank goodness I didn't get selected for a 2020 event, for example. Um, but yeah, it's just it getting the exception letter after all of those rejections made yeah. it so much sweeter. Yeah. It would have been great if I had applied to one and done and I got it, that would have been, that would have felt great. But knowing how high I had climbed to reach that point, yes. it was so much better than yeah. like all those rejections made that success so much, so much better. Hopping back to your keynote topics, when you are giving your speeches or doing any of your coaching, is there a certain data point? Is there a certain piece of your topics that people are relating to more than others? Yeah. So I, I have noticed, especially when I'm speaking to corporate audiences, the discrepancy between women and men when they apply to job roles. Um, everyone, when I mentioned that they nod their heads, they have seen it firsthand wherever they work. Um, a lot of the data points show that, um, men will apply to jobs when they only meet 60% of the qualifications. Women will not apply to that same role and they, unless they meet hundred percent. Yeah. As a result, we have far fewer women sitting in the C-suite in fortune 500 companies than men. I think a lot of that is due to the fact that we wait, we wait until we feel completely ready or completely qualified to go after those dream roles. And we lose out on those opportunities. A lot of these opportunities are given at the first person that jumps at that opportunity. Um, Another thing I've noticed is just since the pandemic and all of the stresses that uh, we had to undergo, um, women are less confident raising their hand in meetings or asking for promotions. Uh, 12% less comfortable than men since the pandemic. So even just in meetings, we're not raising our hands. We're not advocating for ourselves. We're not speaking up. And so um, my whole keynote is about how, not only how can we ourselves feel ready enough to go after our goals, but how can we be advocates and help bring others along with us? If we notice one of our colleagues that has all the potential in the world, but she's just not seeing it. How can we bring her alongside of us and encourage her and show her her potential and encourage her to step up for those leadership opportunities? Some of the opportunities that I went after was because somebody kind of gave me a nudge and said, hey, you should go for this. And it was something that I never even thought I could do, but it was somebody else seeing that potential in me. So it's important just to look around us at our colleagues and notice their gifts and talents and, you know, uh, get them to go after um, promotions and jobs as much as we go after them ourselves. Do you think any part of it has, is it just the overall society and how like the history of what women have gone through in terms of the workforce, or do you think it's maybe a company culture thing where some people are in these positions and it's kind of, that's just how the company is and that's how they operate. What do, what do you think about that? I think it's a little bit of both. Okay. Um, it definitely 
it is easier to advocate for yourself for sure. When your leadership is showing that Yes. Um, certain companies are fantastic at that, where they have a lot of female leadership where people can look at the executive board and see themselves in those executives. That is incredibly important. However, I do think it's a cultural thing where we as a society, we are told, like we're used to holding back and waiting to raise our hands. It starts even when we're in elementary school of, you know, girls will raise their hands until they're called on. Boys will just shout out the answer for a math problem. And so even from a young age, we're learning these norms of when it's okay to kind of advocate for yourself versus wait your turn in line and raise your hand. And so um, I think it's something that we need to teach from a really young age of advocating for yourself, speaking up, um, knowing the gifts that you bring to the table. But then if you're in a leadership position, it's so important to uh, make sure that your company is representing that culture and um, having diversity across the board um, at all types of leadership positions. Completely agree. And I find too, like we were, most of us are in a remote environment, even in, in a remote environment in Zoom, you have the raise the hand thing. Yeah. You see yep. a lot of women raising their hand and the guys just kind of shout out. And I'm like, we got the feature for a reason. Everybody use it. <laughs> um, but I, I agree with you. I think there's a lot of, a, a lot of teachings from when we were younger that kind of, it sticks with us more than it does with men. And it just, it sometimes bulldozes us a little bit mm-hmm. and shuts us down. And I, I wish so badly that you kind of look back and you're like, oh, I wish I wasn't taught that. So I, yeah. Could, yeah, you know, just the small pieces of things. Yeah, for sure. And I think too, like, it's not necessarily a women versus men dynamic, but I do think that like even men in leadership positions need to advocate for the women on their team and, um, notice, and like, to your point, it's so much harder in a virtual environment. You know, when you're in a meeting, you can kind of read the body language and understand when somebody has something to say and they want to speak up when you're in virtual, especially if your camera's not on, it's so much harder to see that. So it's so important to make sure that you're calling on your team members and making sure that everybody has a voice in that meeting because with this technology it's great because of the flexibility but it makes it so much harder to have all the voices heard in the meeting with uh your big bold crazy dream of speaking at tedx event that has happened do you now have another big bold uh goal that you're working towards right now yeah, so my big bold, uh, big bold goal right now. That's easy to say. Um, I'm working on an online course for women, so um, helping women really harness their big bold crazy dreams. Some of us are so used to just the busyness of life, we don't even really know what we want anymore. So my course is going to help us unpack those passions that maybe we've buried a little bit, and then figure out that step one, step two, step three. Yep. to break down those crazy goals so that we can actually achieve them. So I'm hoping to launch that by the end of the year. Perfect. Um, pre-orders will start pretty soon. So I'm really excited about that. So that's my next goal is building out a course to help women really unpack those dreams and get started on them. I love that. And of course you doing more keynote speaking, I'm sure. Yep. Um, what, what is it about being on stage for you? People who are, you know, you wanted to go do public speaking, people who are not very comfortable with public speaking, how, like, how did you become comfortable with that? Yeah. So I think, um, a lot of the passion behind it starts from when I was younger. I just have always loved being on a stage. Um, but even the first time I did a speaking engagement, I was so nervous. I was probably talking like I was auctioning off a hot ticket item, I was sweating. Like it, it was not, not a good performance to say the least. Um, but it was one of those things where I got done with it. And even those gigs where I thought I completely bombed them, don't even kind of blacked out. Don't even know what I said. It's those connections with individual people after the sessions that mean the most to me. So talking to that individual and they're like, Hey, you said this, that 
really resonated with me or meant a lot to me. And I'm like, wait, I said that don't remember that, but cool. I'm glad it, I'm glad it worked for you. Yeah. But it's just this one-on-one connections of seeing the impact that like my stories can have on somebody else. I'm not like some big celebrity. I'm not big author or anything. Yeah. Like my goal is just to share my authentic stories of little old me from Raleigh, North Carolina yeah. and how I went after my goals. And I think it's so cool of having somebody relatable that we can see ourselves in on stage yeah. so that we can start going after our own goals. So I like to say I've gotten better <laughs> since those first few gigs, but it's just one, like anything else, practice, practice, practice. Each gig gets a little bit better. Um, then COVID made it a little bit more difficult, virtual now, you know, another new muscle to practice, but, um, yeah, I, I love it. I love being on the stage, connecting with people. And just the fact that we're back to in-person events is so incredible. Just the energy from the room. I love it. Um, but I, I know it's not for everybody. I know I like to do something that most people are terrified of, um, but that's why I'm here. I want to help people, you know, if it is something you think you might want to do, I can help you reach that goal. I I'm very much on the same stage of, of blacking out sometimes. Like if I'm really comfortable, I'll walk in and completely just nail it. I might talk like a used car salesman though. And just really quickly, like selling off things. But there are moments though, where I black out and I come off. I'm like, how to go? I don't, yeah. I don't remember anything that I said, but I think it all just depends on the environment that I'm in. Um, and who I'm speaking to, I think is what I found. I'm like, if I'm doing corporate events, I'm like, Ooh, I blacked out during that. Um, but if it's other things, there might be some chances where I'm like, I feel really comfortable in the environment that I'm in. And this is really easy for me. Yeah, totally. Yeah. It totally depends on the audience for me. I've always found, and I, I even did this, uh, during dance recitals, but I like to find just a couple people in the audience. So I don't ever look at like the big whole audience yeah. I just find those couple people so now when I'm speaking I find the ones that nod like they do the little head bob I'm like okay you understand what I'm saying yeah. so it's kind of I pick somebody you know to the left center right and I just talk to those three people if yeah. I impact more fantastic but my goal is just to impact those three people in the room and then I've done a, done a good job so that yeah. definitely helps with the nerves and just yeah. slowing down my speaking and all of yeah. that but it's tough yeah it's you never know what you're going to get with an event. So some events feel great going into it. Others, not really sure, but that's okay. It's all exciting. I I said it to somebody uh, a couple of weeks ago. I was like the whole, when we were younger, you just imagine everybody naked in the audience. I'm like, that doesn't work. I think. Yeah, no thanks. (laughs) I'm like, it doesn't work anymore. It just doesn't. My last question for you, Lauren, is just what inspires you? Yeah. What inspires me is seeing other people finally realize their potential. I love being able to see somebody that like they have this skill that they're good at and they have no idea that it's within them and pulling it out and just seeing that transformation, seeing the before and after noticing other people that are doing big, crazy things that if you had told them five, 10 years ago that they would be doing this, they yeah. would have thought you were crazy. Absolutely. I I love seeing those stories of just people leaning into their gifts and their talents and utilizing them to the biggest, best potential that they can. I think to your point, when people look at you like you're crazy or say that you're crazy, that's the most beautiful reassurance that you're yeah. doing something amazing. And I, mm-hmm. I, I love that because it's, I even love when people tell me that you can't do something. I'm like, watch me. I'm going to go prove you wrong. But in the same, I think when people look at you in that crazy sense, they're like, you'll never do this. I'm like, "Mm, I believe that I can. I'm going to go prove you wrong. Yeah. 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 Beautiful moments. Well, Lauren, I can't thank you enough for coming on and speaking with me today. You guys, if you do not follow Lauren, all of her socials are going to be linked down below. So you can go give her a follow. And Lauren, I can't wait to see this uh, program you put together for women. Uh, I think it's going to be incredible and, uh, I just can't wait to see what you do next. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. Yes, absolutely. And as always, I will see you guys back here next time. Bye y'all.